and has presented many, many papers on the psych on psychology and the Holocaust. I met Anne in 1994 at Yad Vashem when she just gave a brilliant lecture and I was very impressed then and so happy when she told me she was coming to Melbourne for a holiday and I said, as part of your holiday, can you come to the Holocaust Centre and give a talk? So I'm really happy you're here. Um, Anne has led many student tours, university student tours to Germany and Poland. She's also received numerous awards, including the Drew Uni University Presidential Award for Distinguished Teaching. And in 2012, Anne was a recipient of the Sister Rose Thiering Award by the New Jersey Commission on Holocaust Education. Um, Anne has retired from her, from her full-time position at Drew University, but continues to teach seminars on psychology of the Holocaust to both graduate and undergraduate students. Um, and you will see we're very fortunate to have Anne tonight. And her talk tonight will be on coping with extreme stress during the Holocaust. So could you please welcome Anne. Good evening. I'm very honored to be asked to speak with the, well, what I thought of me with the museum guides and I guess others in attendance tonight. I want to thank Sue Campbell for arranging this. And as she mentioned, Sue and I first met uh, in the summer of 1994 at Yad Vashem, Israel, when we both participated in the seminar for educators from abroad. We then met again at the uh, Millennial Holocaust Conference in Oxford, England, and uh, here we are, a picture of us from 2000 that, um, this was actually taken on, a, we were taking a walking tour of the East End of, of London. It's nice to be back in touch with Sue after all these years and to have the opportunity to speak with all of you. I've been asked to speak on the topic of coping with extreme stress during the Holocaust, and I understand that there are a number of survivors in the audience today. You, of course, are the experts on what happened in the ghettos and the concentration camps. <clears throat> I can only share what I've learned over the years from studying what others have written, listening to oral histories, and speaking with survivors who live in the New York metropolitan area. I also want to add that the theory, and so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to outline a theory for you um, about stress and, and, and coping. Um, and the theory that I am using I, was not developed during the Holocaust, and I make this point all the time with my students. Nobody during the Holocaust was running around doing research. People were just trying to cope. So after the Holocaust, and in some cases many, many, many years after the Holocaust, people, uh, psychologists who are reading memoirs, who are talking to people, some in a clinical practice, and by the way, I should say, I am a psychologist, psychologist but I'm not a clinician. I am a social psychologist, and what that means is that I have studied, and the way I understand psychology is through how people's feelings, thoughts, um, behaviors are affected by other people around you, and sometimes they don't even have to be around you. They could be in your head, in the sense of thinking about what would my mother have said, what would my father have said, but that's the way it affects our behavior. So this is the particular approach that I take to understanding. So the people. This particular theory that I'm going to talk about, uh, again, was developed after the fact, but um, I will be making reference at points to the work of Viktor Frankl. Some of you may know his work. He was a survivor and a psychiatrist, originally from Vienna, whose theory about people's search for meaning, even in the most extreme circumstances, was actually developed before the war, and according to him, actually helped him survive. Some of you may be familiar with his book, Man's Search for Meaning. Another survivor I'm going to make reference to is Isabella Leitner. Isabella Leitner was a child survivor from Hungary who wrote down, after the war, she wrote down her thoughts on little pieces of paper and basically stuffed them into her apron pocket. Um, and eventually, she gathered them together into a memoir, which initially was called Fragments of Isabella, and then she wrote a second part of it. Both of these survivors give us insight into what was happening to them mentally, emotionally, psychologically, while they were experiencing it. Of course, edited after the war. 
I will also share insights I have gleaned from my friend Hetty Brash, who is down there. Hetty is also a child survivor from Hungary, and um, I've learned a lot from her and um, just in conversations and from listening to her talk many times. If possible, I would like to hold questions and discussion until after I've completed my comments. Okay. So. So stress of coping under extreme conditions. This is a theory that was first developed by Richard Lazarus and some of his colleagues in the early 1980s. And as, um, as we'll look at in a little bit, it, he, Richard Lazarus was a, um, what's called a cognitive psychologist. What he really focused on was how people think about situations and how they mentally construe situations, how they interpret what is happening to them. So he talks about, or they I should say, because it's a, a, a group of psychologists, they talk about stress as the negative balance between stressors and resources. So stress is defined as a relational concept, that first there is the perception that there is a situation of harm, threat, and challenge. I think it's pretty clear that living through the Holocaust is a situation of harm, threat, and challenge, and it's an uncertainty about whether one has the resources to deal with the situation. So it makes stress then as a relational concept that once a time, you might be in the same situation and you may not feel stressed. But at another time, you might feel stressed because you might feel that you don't have the right resources, the proper resources, to help you um, deal with the situation. I also want to note that this is a, um, a theory that is I'm going to use to talk about coping with extreme stress during the Holocaust, but it's actually a theory that we can all use in our lives every day, and we probably do, but don't even think about how we're doing, how we're using it. Okay. So this is a um, just a diagram of the basic premise of Lazarus's theory. So again, as I mentioned, it's a cognitive theory, which means that it focuses on how people mentally frame their environment. This doesn't mean that people necessarily are aware of what they are thinking at the time a decision is made. So it could seem as though people are just reacting to a situation instinctively without thought. But this theory proposes that people living under stressful situations actually engage in an appraisal process. And there are two kinds of appraisal. I'm going to walk you through those two different kinds of appraisal in a few minutes. The theory proposes that people are not passive or helpless, but actually shape the stress experience based on how they construe the situation. And this construal process is what they call appraisal. An example of this appraisal process is from my friend Hetty. Okay, when she, her mother, and her older sister first arrived at Auschwitz, her mother was directed to go to one line, and her sister was directed to go to another line. Hetty was sent to go with her mother. But her mother basically told her, go with your sister. So clearly her mother is trying to figure out, if you ask her what she was doing, she couldn't say, I'm trying to figure out which is the better line here. But clearly there's some kind of appraisal that is going on as to which line is the better one and why should, and Hetty should go with her sister. Um, Hetty, who was 14 years old at the time and who maintains that she always obeyed her mother, did exactly what her mother told her to do. So she quietly walked <coughs> behind everybody and went over to her sister. But then when she was with her sister, she decided she really wanted to be with her mother. So she walked back again to her, sister, to, to her mother. Her mother said, no, you have to go with your sister. So she's walking back and forth, trying to figure this out, and only later, she was, she was told by someone that there was actually an SS officer who had his gun trained on her, uh, ready to shoot, but apparently he was distracted by something else. And this is one of the many, many instances of luck which saved Hetty's life. So before I actually, um, go further into this theory of cognitive appraisal, I want to say a few words about luck. 
Almost every survivor I've met has said to me that the main reason that they survived was luck. This is actually a quote from um, Lazarus's article, uh, that many factors outside the control of the person determined his or her fate, and we'll come back and look at some of these also. Age, sex, race, religion, food supply, camp and work assignment, physical strength and health, but the odds were overwhelmingly against survival. In a situation where only one out of 600 survived, to link outcome to coping skill would be not only unreasonable, but unprovable. And then they go on to say, while the victims who survived must be credited with choosing and fighting, those who did not cannot be considered less committed or less competent since chance played so great a role in survival. And I want to come back and talk about this choosing and fighting in a second. <clears throat> but this concept of luck, and um, my husband who's here with me, we just came from uh, New Zealand. We were a month in New Zealand, and while we were there, we went to the Holocaust. They have a small Holocaust museum in Wellington. And there was a special exhibition that was uh, based on somebody's um, dissertation in which what she was really interested in talking about this and, and pursuing this concept of luck. Because what she said was that every survivor she had ever heard told her that the main reason that they survived was first luck. But she said it's got to be luck plus something else. That the luck is the fact that Teddy wasn't shot. And I could tell you, you know, a zillion examples that she gave of doing something where somebody looked askance, where somebody said, you know, let them go, whatever. And um, so it's luck plus, this concept of choosing and fighting. Some survivors will disclaim this phrase and say they did not do anything to survive. They had no choices. And what did they have to fight with anyway? So for example, Hetty will say, has told me that she didn't do anything Yet her story, as I just mentioned, is filled with these examples of um, somehow making decisions which put her in extreme danger, but she managed, someone was looking the wrong way, someone said, go ahead, I'm not going to do anything. These were luck, this, this was definitely luck. Survivors, survivor memoirs, also suggests that in fact choices were made. And here I want to um, talk a little bit about um, an incident that Isabella Leitner writes about in her memoir. So Isabella Leitner, when, when they went to Auschwitz, there were six children, five sisters, one brother, and her mother. Her mother and her very youngest um, sister were sent to the gas chamber immediately. So there were four of them, four sisters and a brother. And they were separated, right? They were in different lagers in Auschwitz. And um, she writes, Auschwitz lent itself to nothing. What could one do there to be a socially conscious human being? What could one do there to be a human being at all? With all odds against him, Philip is the brother, found a way. He devised a means of communication. He was in a man's log of some distance away, separated from us, as each log was, by electrified barbed wire fence. One touch meant electrocution. Somehow, come back to the somehow, somehow Philip acquired a knife. He found pieces of wood and began to carve messages. My four sisters are in Raga C. Their name is Katz. Whoever finds this piece of wood, please keep tossing it over the fences until it reaches Raga C. And miraculously, the messages always reached us. Daily, their mailmen of Auschwitz, an unbroken chain of sufferers, would deliver the wood, com deliver the wood communication. Daily, at approximately the same spot, at approximately the same time, we would be standing there waiting for our mail from our ingenious brother, from the, keep, from the keeper of our souls. And the communication would always bear the same message. 
You must survive, you must live, you simply must. We not only have to pay them back, this is not reason enough, we must build a better future of blood shedding, a free from blood shedding. And no one, uh, and no one planet Auschwitz, which is what Isabella Leitner called Auschwitz, one was reduced to being an animal, Philip, your wooden gifts might have contributed to our survival. They just might have. So thank you, Philip. So Philip, somehow, he's in this log, gets a knife, somehow gets a block of wood, and comes up with this idea that he's going to carve these messages in this block, and he's going to send it over the fence, and the next person's going to send it over the fence, and the next person. So here's a person. You, He's in a situation of extreme stress, obviously. He has these resources of a block of wood and a knife, and he's trying to figure out what to do. This is the appraisal process, okay? So um, now I want to talk about a little bit about the difference between the primary appraisal process and the secondary appraisal process, all right? So the primary appraisal, the initial definition is, this is stressful. And we all know that, um, and as I just read from Isabella Leighton, that Auschwitz lends itself to nothing. The conditions were brutal. They were designed to strip people of their humanity and all sense of meaning. And here are just a couple of um, the specifics of that brutal system. It was organized to systematically produce destruction. The boundaries were difficult to penetrate. There were barbed wire, there was barbed wire, there was electrified fences, there were guards, there were dogs, there were watchtowers. How do you get out? You walked into the situation. Opportunities to fight back were relatively limited. It was unpredictable that the way in which the Nazis actually played head games with people in the sense of changing the schedule, or you would never know if this was a good transport or not a good transport, or good work. Uh, assignment, not a good work assignment, things that people would be lined up thinking that they were going to the gas chamber and then the Nazis would call it all off. So there was this kind of unpredictability that you could never really know what was going to happen. The lack of familial, social, cultural institution structures to provide support and meaning. Some people were lucky. Um, Isabella Leitner was lucky that she was able to stay with her sisters. Hetty, my friend Hetty, was lucky in that she was able to stay with her sister throughout the whole war experience. Um, and they, after they left Auschwitz and went to um, various other labor camps. And uh, sometimes it was forced violation of belief systems. The people were put into situations where they were, they didn't feel like they had a choice and they had to do um, things that in normal situations one would not do. Um, but So this is a really brutal situation that one is in, but somehow within this, there is this kind of appraisal that people are trying to figure out what are the resources, what can they do, how can they respond to this situation. Um, Sue mentioned that uh, I led some student tours um, to Germany and to Poland, and I can remember when I, we went to Poland, we, our guide in, uh, in Warsaw was, a, was a, a survivor who had an incredible story. And um, we'd be, he'd be taking us around and talking to us and taking us different places, and every once in a while what would get interjected into his talk was what to do, what to do. And I could almost hear him saying, in the sense that this is an appraisal process, that in, during the war, he's going, what to do, what to do. There's a way of, um, within the limited confines of what you have, that there is something that you can do. So that's the, the primary appraisal is just being aware that this is a really, really stressful situation. Secondary appraisal, then, is assessing one's resources. And so there are a whole bunch of different resources. Physical strength and agility and stamina is number one. This is a picture of the stone quarry at Mauthausen, and you may or may not know that what the um, uh, 
people in Mauthausen were required to do was to pick up these huge stones and bring them from one side of the camp to the other side of the camp and then just take them from that side of the camp back to this side. There was no meaning in doing it except to use up people. Well, obviously, if you didn't have physical strength, you weren't going to be able to survive this. So this is a resource. Some people are more biologically able to withstand these kinds of stresses. Um, for example, dealing with extreme temperatures. <clears throat> So in 1998, um, a colleague and I, we were invited to a big conference, uh, Holocaust conference in Lübeck, Germany, which is around 70 kilometers north of Hamburg. And we got there a day early just to deal with some jet lag. And we decided we'd go into Hamburg and because uh, we had never been there. And we took one of these buses that takes you around the city. And while we were on it, there was a little um, brochure in the bus that said what you could do in, in Hamburg, and it said something about the Neuengamme concentration camp. So my friend, Jackie, and I we looked at each other, and we said, oh, we really need to go to Neuengamme concentration camp. So we asked the guide on the bus, how can we get there? And she turned ashen, and she said, you don't want to go there. And we said, but we do want to go there. You don't want to go there. But we do want to go there. So we finally figured out how to go there. We took a public bus. We, took a, we got to the train, the train took us to a bus, we took a public bus, the bus left us off, off at the end of a road, and we walked the last kilometer to Neuengamme. Now I am wearing three layers, cashmere, cashmere coat, hat, boots, gloves, and I am freezing. And all I can say to myself is, how in the world did anybody survive this? <laughs> so clearly, the fact that this resource, that some people could deal with this a little bit better than others, was a contributing factor to survival. Other um, agility and stamina. Okay, so this is my friend Hetty um, when she was a child, and she was a gymnast. And she was extremely agile and um, could do all kinds of things. Uh, she says that if the war hadn't happened, she probably would have been a gymnast. She could climb trees, which she did, to steal fruit. She could climb into buildings, which she did. Um, sometimes it put her into danger, but somehow luck was always with her. We know that stories of children in ghettos, especially the Warsaw Ghetto, who were small enough to be able to squeeze through the sewers or through gates to get food and bring it back in. This is a resource that um, people had um, in terms of their agility. Um, again, Ruck played a, a big role here because Hetty was caught numerous times stealing, and fortunately each time the person who caught her did not report her. Okay, so other resources that people had to deal with, again, physical strength, agility, stamina, skills. What kind of, I'm, I'm going to go through all of these very briefly, what kind of skills did people bring? with them that could help them cope with this and actually help them to survive. Story of a man, um, survivor in New Jersey, watchmaker. Actually, he wasn't really a watchmaker. The Nazis asked who was a watchmaker because they needed people to fix watches. And he said, I'm a watchmaker, figuring if they're asking that they need watchmakers, then I'm going to be a watchmaker. And the other people who were watchmakers taught him how to be a watchmaker, you know, and fix watches at that time. But a seamstress to sew clothing, um, a barber, a chemist, Primo Levi, okay, story of a chemist. Anything that the Nazis deemed as valuable, as a valuable skill, could help people. And if you didn't have a skill, like in this example of this man, David, who said he was a watchmaker, if you didn't have a skill, you were going to try to make, acquire that skill very, very quickly. Other kinds of skills that um, have been written around, you know, fair around, music, being able to play music. Now that could serve several purposes. It could be that you were playing, that you were um, chosen, like in this, this picture, I don't know if you can see this down here, that these were pris the prisoners' orchestra on Sunday concert for the SS. These were not people who were playing for themselves. They were playing for the SS, but the fact that they could play and be chosen helped them 
that skill helped them survive. In other cases, such as in the ghetto orchestra, um, these were people who were using music for themselves to help them remain human, to help them retain some sense of control and dignity in their lives, to sometimes transport them into another situation. And some of you may have seen this a number of years ago. There was going around on, uh, on the internet, uh, Alice Hurd Sumner, who was a concert pianist whose musical talent and cheery optimism saved her from death. Um, and the Ashwitz guards kept her alive so she could give performances. So again, this was a skill, art. If you could draw, you might be able to do something certainly for yourself. So again, my friend Peggy is a fabulous artist. Um, when she finally came to the United States and um, went to university, she went to university for art education. We have lots of her. She would always make New Year's cards. They were handmade New Year's cards. We had a whole little, we used to call it the Hitty Gap Brash Gallery of these cards. But she would find whatever she could somehow just as Philip somehow found the block of wood and somehow found this knife to write these, these messages to send to his sister. Hetty somehow found something that she could draw with, a pencil, a piece of paper, a piece of charcoal, burnt, a piece of burnt something, and she would draw these pictures. And she would draw them primarily for herself to maintain her sense of, it, it kept her alive. But one time there was an SS guard, a female guard, who pulled her aside and said, are you the one who draws all the pictures? And Hetty said, yes. And she said, follow me. And the guard wanted her to make a Christmas card, draw a Christmas card that she could send back to her family. She had a skill. She came in helpful at that particular time. Um, OK. This is another survivor, also from Hungary. Uh, his name is, I don't know if you can see it, David Weiss Polivny, and he wrote a book called The Sword, A Life of Learning in the Shadow of Destruction. He was very learned in Torah and Talmud, and he was deported to Auschwitz, and then to Groves Rosen, and then to Ackerman, which was another slave labor camp. So in this book, <coughs> the book and the sword, he talks about the fact that um, because he was learned in, um, in Talmud and Torah, and that every once in a while they would have free time, that he would actually join with some of the other men, and they would, because they had memorized this, they would actually spend time studying Torah and Talmud together in the camp, um, and it was helpful for them. And then he writes, once teaching Mishnah, I was observed by a capo, also called Weiss, whose works were used, whose workers were used as slave labor by a German company called Ackerman that was constructing underground tunnels to protect the soon to be built munition factories from being bombed by the Allies. The capo Weiss, who wasn't the kindest of capos, but was nevertheless taken by my teaching Mishnah, transferred me to this other camp, Ackerman. Being so young, I was immediately assigned the job of carrying the drills into and out of the tunnel. That entitled me to all the privileges, benefits, and bonuses that those doing heavier work received. This was not the only time my learning endeared me to a capo. Another by the name of Lefkowitz, who told me he was a former Gera Hasid, always pumped me for the erotic parts of the Talmud and wanted me to recite them to him, but once he also saved me from a selection, which probably would have meant death. So the fact that he had this skill, which in the context of being in a concentration camp would seem to be totally irrelevant, all of a sudden becomes something that is useful and resourceful and actually saves his life in many ways. Okay. So we've talked about physical strength, agility, stamina, skills, age. Okay. So age, being younger or looking young or sometimes looking a little older is helpful. So Victor Frankl writes in his book that um, every day 
people should, the men, he's talking about men specifically, um, shave daily, if at all possible, even if you have to use a piece of glass to do it, even if you have to give your last piece of bread for it, you will look younger and the scraping will make your cheeks look ruddier. Therefore, remember, shave, stand, and walk smartly. So again, figuring out what do you do and how does age help? And for the most part, we know that the very, very young, the really small children, were sent to the gas chambers immediately, the older people similarly. So it's really the adolescents' age that are perceived by the Nazis to be the healthiest, the strongest, to have the most skills, who seem to have in, in that first selection process. So Hetty also tells the story of when she, she was 14 years old and she was little, she's still little. And she came and she was in this lineup, she had no idea where she was, she had no idea what this was all about, and she hears a voice behind her say, they ask you how old you are, say you're 17. And she says, no, I'm 14. The guy said, 17, you're 17. So, and stand on your toes. So she stands on her toes and she's 17 and she passes that because age, youth, was a resource. Gender. For the most part, more women than men were sent directly to the gas chambers. A woman needed to appear physically fit or otherwise useful in some way. Um, the late Sybil Milton, who was the senior historian at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, noted that of those people who were not selected for death, more women survived than men, which she attributed to gender socialization. And what she meant by that is that these were people who were trained to, as women, take care of things, keep the house clean, keeping things hygienic, so washing up after yourself, making sure that things are as sanitary as possible, and they were also trained to take care of others. And this brings us to this next resource of relationships. So Isabella Leitner, as I mentioned, was sent to Auschwitz with, um, there were actually five sisters, but four sisters who went through the um, concentration camp experience, three of whom survived. Their bond both facilitated their survival and at times Isabella found it even burdensome because she writes that she wishes that she didn't have to stay alive for her sisters. But in fact, she did stay alive for her sisters. They all stayed alive for each other. Um, similarly, Hetty stayed with her sister at Auschwitz, at Obenheide, at the slave labor camp at Bremen, and even at Bergen-Belsen when they were liberated from the British. Women's memoirs are filled with examples of how people formed camp families, even if it wasn't real sisters. They formed families if they didn't have a biological family with them in the camps. The socio-emotional support among these family members often physically sustained them. They shared their bread and other resources and Lisa was taking me around the center today and she pointed out the um, little gifts and charms that the women made for each other who were in the armaments factory. And you read about this all the time of women finding whatever they could to make if it's someone's birthday a little something that looks like a cupcake, even if it's not a cupcake. So relationships were a really sustaining factor. And even if you weren't with family, survivors could imagine being with their family. So Victor Frankl writes about the fact that what kept him alive was hoping that his wife would have survived and thinking about his wife but also thinking about when he got, when this was all over, when this horrible thing was over, he was going to be able to rewrite, because he had the manuscript of, of Man's Search for Meaning, which was taken away from him, and he was going to rewrite it, and he pictured himself being in a large lecture hall, where he was going to all these people who would be part of his community, that they would, and that this is what sustained him, um, being with his medical colleagues. Um, David Weiss Halevny, the one, the person who I just was uh, talking about, who wrote um, the book and about the, 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 who was the, the Torah scholar, also talks about one time 
there's a, a guard who has a sandwich that is wrapped in some piece of paper and he takes it off and he throws it on the ground and it turns out this piece of paper again is a tractate from Mishnah. And Pavetli dives onto the ground, not even realizing what he's doing, to get this piece of paper. And the guard thinks, what, this guy, what, what is happening? He's having a fit or something. Well, he took this piece of paper, and again, on whatever free time he had, he and the other men would study this tractate again and again and again. And it wasn't only just, and this is also belief value systems that sustained him, but the fact that they created a little community amongst themselves to study this text was also a resource that helped them to just get through this horrible situation. Um, personality. We know that people are different in terms of how much stress they can handle. Some are more resilient than others. Um, so Faye tells me that while she climbed up trees to steal fruit and into bombed out stores, in Bremen to steal food and clothes, her sister was like a mess. She barely spoke and was afraid all the time. Now, Hetty says that she was, now she says, she was stupid for doing, for taking all those risks because at any time something could happen. But age comes into play here also because Hetty was only 14 and her sister was 20. And we now know that the frontal lobes of the brains of adolescents had not yet fully developed. And that's why adolescents are so impulsive and do such crazy things because they really are not thinking ahead. So in this case, this was actually a very good thing that she wasn't worrying about if I do this, that someone's gonna do this and this. It's just, I have this situation, I can do it, I have the resources, I can do something. There are also differences in imagination, creativity, outgoingness, sensitivity to stimuli in the environment, all these could serve as resources, or it could make it more difficult to cope with extreme stress. There was no place to hide in the concentration camp. So if you were sensitive to sounds, smells, touch, sights, etc., by nature, everything was going to be that much more stressful. And a final resource that I want to talk about, I don't know if you can see it down here, is humor. Okay. A lot of survivors have told me that they laughed a lot in the camps. Something that one doesn't think about. Um, so here are some examples of the use of humor. Um, people refer to Mein Kampf as Mein Kampf. That there were two types of Aryans. There were non-Aryans and barb Aryans, barbarians. Um, this is a joke. As Hitler's armies faced more and more setbacks, he asked his astrologer, am I going to lose the war? Yes, the astrologer said. Then am I going to die, Hitler asked? Yes. When am I going to die? On a Jewish holiday. But on what holiday? Any day you die will be a Jewish holiday. So this was, again, people who had a sense of humor. And what does humor do? Humor allows us to engage in a kind of cognitive resistance to what is happening. Humor is often based on seeing two contradictory meanings or recognizing the absurdity of a situation and finding humor, using humor in the camps. It didn't change the situation per se, but it helped soften the horror. And again, I've heard many survivors talk about how much they actually laughed in the camps. Viktor Frankl, in his memoir, actually proposed that every day inmates should tell jokes to each other. And often the Nazis didn't even realize that they were being made, that they were the butt of the jokes, which actually added to the power of this kind of humor. Um, so another example of, of, of jokes, um, that this is a, another uh, joke, I guess. Goebbels was trying German schools. At one, he asked the students to call out patriotic slogans. Heil Hitler, shouted one child. Very good, said Goebbels. Deutschland über alles, another called out. Excellent. How about a stronger slogan? A hand shot up, and Goebbels nodded. Our people shall live forever, the little boy said. Wonderful, exclaimed Goebbels. What is your name, young man? Israel Goldberg. <laughs> so, you know, so people, this is, again, was a kind of resource. And for children, the way this got translated 
was play. So, and this is a whole book, there's a whole book about play in, during the Holocaust, which is absolutely fascinating. This is, happens to be a pic, one of the pictures from the book. This is in the Woods Ghetto, and I understand that there are a lot of survivors in this community here who have gone through the, the, the Woods Ghetto. Um, children often would tell jokes also. There's one example in this book. They would play games, they would find something to make into a game. You know how children do that? They, they could find anything to make a toy out of. So even in these most extreme circumstances, they would find a toy. Um, they would play a game that um, would be sort of like Nazis and Jews, where they, and, and children's games are very interesting because it's a way in which they are rehearsing something and getting control over a situation that's scary. So they would play this game where some of the kids were supposed to be Nazis and some of them were supposed to be Jews, and the Jews were going to be, were going to be the powerful ones. They were going to be the ones who were going to win. The problem is they never could find anybody who wanted to be a Nazi. <laughs> or another example is that the kids would, in the ghetto, if you pass by an SS officer, you're supposed to take your hat off, right, to um, show respect. So the kids, the SS officer would be here, and they would take the hat off, go around, and they would, one after another, they just kept on doing this over and over and over again, just running around the SS officers, taking their hats off, basically making fun of the SS officers who didn't realize what they were doing. So even kids could figure out, again, did it change the situation? Did it change the fact that they were hungry? Did it change the fact that they were starving? Did it change the fact that there were diseases? Did it change the fact that any day they could be deported, that they could die? It didn't change that, but what it changed is the way they thought about the situation, which gave them a little bit of control, psychological control, to be able to um, make it through another day. So again, just to review, we have stresses, we have resources, we have a primary appraisal, we have secondary appraisal, and according to this stress, Lazarus, stress is the negative balance between when the stresses overwhelm the resources. That's the stress. Coping is the way in which whatever behaviors you can generate to manage the stress. So there are different kinds, and I've given you a number of different examples, but just to um, make it a, a little clearer. This can lead to certain kinds of actions, so it could lead to information seeking, just finding out what was <coughs> happening. Um, I think Lisa mentioned that the story, in, uh, and it, it might be someone here whose family had a radio. Okay. Okay, so having a radio is having information. Finding out from somebody who just arrived is getting information. Finding out about what happens over there, what over there, is finding out information just so that you might be able to then figure out what to do. Um, there were uh, subtle and not so subtle forms of resistance. So we know about that there were armed uprisings in um, ghettos and camps. Uh, active resistance, sabotage, so the people who, uh, women who worked, and I think this was actually the Butch Ghetto, and perhaps someone in the discussion even knows more about this, that um, they had a clothing factory where they were sewing clothes for the SS guards, and they sometimes would do a pretty sloppy job on these, uh, making these clothes, so the clothes would fall apart immediately. Now again, it didn't change the fact that they were in this situation, but it gave them a sense of, we're gonna get back at them, um, blowing up a crematorium. Um, you know that this example of four women who worked in an armaments factory and who every day took a little teaspoon or even less of gunpowder and put it in their in their dresses and their pockets. And if they would bring it that back to, to um, some men somewhere else, who then when they got enough that they would actually they did blow up a crematorium. And if they were going to be apprehended. They would just take the pocket and they would whip the gun powder out and they would rub it into the ground so nobody would know. They were caught and um, most of them were uh, hung publicly at Auschwitz. Um, escape. People actually were able to escape.
escape. There's an amazing story of escape from Auschwitz by Rudolf Berger and Alexander Drexler. And they knew, they, they watched when the guards were there, they watched what time they turned the lights off, they watched what time, what, what time various things happened, and they went and they hid in a wood pile right in the middle of Auschwitz. And they put meat powder outside of it so that the dogs would be, they would not pick up the scent of them. And at some point, they got out of this wood pile and they were able to get through the fence and they actually went and escaped from Auschwitz. And they got to Hungary to try to warn the Hungarian Jewish community, which was the last community um, to go to the concentration camps, that what was happening. And unfortunately, the people in Hungary the community did not believe them, and nothing happened. But that was an amazing feat of figuring out, watching, getting information, using whatever resources. But if you couldn't do that, there was cultural, spiritual resistance. So studying the Mishnah, studying the Talmud, singing, art, the Torah discussions, as I was saying, helping helping somebody else. Anything that could help people maintain their sense of dignity, to help them maintain their sense of identity. And, um, and, and this is really what Victor Frankl talks about, this palliative finding some reason to go on. Psychological palliative. If it's for somebody else, or to survive, to tell the story, because somebody has to tell the story, or to survive, because somebody in this family has to survive, just so pushing yourself through it in some way. These theorists also talk about what happens in this appraisal process and the various kinds of actions is to actually convert these threats into challenges. So, um, this is a quote from an article by um, several Israeli psychologists, Kahana, Kahana, Harold, and Siegel, you don't need to know all their names. What they talk about is that anything that would enhance a sense of control and confidence and therefore reduce a sense of helplessness and hopelessness, and their whole article is about how helping other people helped people to cope. So, um, to quote them, the experience of the Holocaust survivor was one of incessant and overwhelming threat. Yet helping others, even in this stressful and threatening context, could enhance a sense of control and competence and thereby reduce helplessness and hopelessness. If the person suffering from hunger could share his or her meager rations, or the one suffering from cold could share his blanket with another, this act could serve as part of a psychological healing process. So even helping, sometimes this was not possible. And so what we also know is that people needed to engage in tunnel vision. They needed to actually shut themselves down. They needed to be able to just see right in front of them what was happening, a kind of self-numbing, not hear, not see, not smell, not know, just sort of go one step at a time. And in the extreme, there would be this complete psychological shutdown, which would lead to a physical shutdown. And this is what um, in the literature talks about this, the, the Muslim men, the people who just gave up and just, just died. And Franco talks about in his, in his book about he could tell. He knew when people started, when survivors, when the people started to give away their meager belongings to somebody else, he could predict that the next day that person would be dead because they had just given up. So not everybody can muster all of these resources because it's also a psychological resource to, to be able to get through all of this. Um, okay. Post Holocaust, say just a few words about this. The war is over. People are supposed to return to this normal life. 
after being in an abnormal life, the appraisal process now is tinged with Holocaust experiences. And for many survivors who have lived in this hostile environment where their resources weren't adequate, there are also symbols of a hostile environment, cue danger now. So um, I remember hearing a, a, um, a survivor who lives in New Jersey talk about driving on the highway and in the highways they have these walls that were built that are sound barriers, but it was like, what's behind the walls? To him, the walls had to do with ghettos. There must be a ghetto on the other side. Being confronted by um, a police officer, being confronted by anybody in a uniform could trigger the, the fact that this is this appraisal, that I'm back there where I was. Um, I have, I have a colleague who was in the psychology department with me whose who's, uh, stepfather was, um, sounds to me like he basically hit himself in the woods um, as a teenager. And when she was a kid, and in the 1960s, one of the fashion was uh, pinstripe, like overalls and pinstripes. Well, his stepfather, you cannot wear pinstripes. Clog shoes. No clog shoes. Um, I don't know whether you have scouts in Australia, in the United States, scouts, and the younger level of scouts, brownies, they wear brown uniforms. No brown uniforms. Okay, so all of this is cueing. All of this is saying that there's danger. The appraisal process of danger and hostility is being revved up again. Psychic numbing may actually continue. People may need to remain shut down, may need to forget, and we know that Watson and Lisa and I were talking about this and she was pointing out certain exhibits. People didn't talk for a very long time. Sometimes people didn't talk because nobody wanted to listen to them, but people didn't talk because it was too painful. And there is actually brain chemistry about how the stimuli can overload the brain and then some of the receptors in the brain sort of shut down, which lead to sort of a numbing and an understimulation, which then it becomes too much. So the brain sort of receptors open up again. And this is part of what's used to be called survivor syndrome, sort of these, these um, fluctuations between hypersensitivity and total numbness, and that there's actually brain chemistry that goes along with this. The gap between the palliative hopes, so you got yourself through this experience because your wife, your mother, your child, your community, something, your wife, your child, it's not there. Your community, you go back, it's not there. This um, loss of family, this loss of community, sometimes loss of belief, the discrepancy between what you are holding onto to get through it and what the reality is can actually lead to um, experiencing liberation as being um, not a very pleasant thing at all. And uh, there's a member of the, of the board at my center who's a second generation uh, from originally from Slovakia. Her mother wrote a little passage. Her mother, both of her parents were uh, survivors from Auschwitz, and her mother wrote a story uh, in which she said that the saddest day of her life was the day that they were liberated. And why was that the saddest day? It's because she, most of the women she was with were from Poland, but she was originally from Czechoslovakia, and she had nowhere to go. And all these other people were gonna scatter and the reality of what was happening. And so the appraisal, post-Holocaust appraisal, can also include the comparison between now and then. And the, last, the loss of these past resources and um, thinking about you know, what was and is no more. Um, sometimes in returning to a normality, quote, Reflecting back on the violation of beliefs and values, what people might have done during the war. I don't know if you remember this, Sue, but I remember one of the lectures we heard at Yad Vashem was by a woman by the name of Ruth Elias. 
and she talked about how she had to actually smother her baby. I mean, this is the most difficult thing you could actually do. And there's also another member of my center's board who was a child survivor, really little child, and they were in hiding, and um, her mother tried to poison her. Didn't succeed, but how do you live with that afterwards? So everything, the post-Holocaust experience is, is very much affected by this. Um, a changed belief in the ability to master demands and threats. And I put this as a picture of the partisans, because the, from the research that I've read, people who are members of the partisans, they actually come out sort of with the best, strongest psychological adaptation afterwards, because they were there fighting. They were doing something. They were in control of the situation. Um, but not everybody was, and even some people who did some amazingly courageous things afterwards describe themselves as being mice. It's like they've used up all of their psychological resources during the war, and now they just can't seem to muster the energy to do anything. So it's, after the fact, coming to terms with the actions that one took in an abnormal world when one is expected to return to a normal world, if that's even possible. So, aids to healing. And I hope that looks familiar. I took it from your website. It looks much better in real life um, than on your website. I think first morning. You know, a lot of survivors didn't give themselves, weren't given the opportunity to mourn. They're thrown back into a situation. They have this need and desire to recreate a life and a culture, and mourning sort of gets put on the, on the sideline. Um, and again, people don't really want to think, people don't want to hear about it. But later in life, and I think that this part of it is explains why there's often this 40-year gap till people start talking, people start writing. Um, there's a psychologist by the name of Eric Erickson who developed a lifespan theory of development, where he says that the later stages of life are characterized by life reviews. So many of you who are sitting in this room, I know I have, we, you know, thinking back upon your life and what have you accomplished in your life and, you know, what things might, might you regret in your life. Well, for Holocaust survivors, obviously, this entails remembering years of discrimination, persecution, segregation, ghettoization, incarceration, loss of loved ones, loss of innocence, and lots and lots of loss. But I'm hoping that survivors also can hold on to their appreciation for the fact that they've been able to rebuild their lives after the war, to create families, to go into professions, made amazing contributions in all aspects of life. And finally, I think there's a recognition of how lucky one is that one got through this. Um, I know the survivors I talk to say, I can't believe, I can't believe I went through this, I can't believe I got through this, I can't believe, some of them also say, I can't believe what the world is like now, I never thought that that would, but that's another, that's another lecture. Um, so, um, I hope that this was not too technical. Um, oh, finally, yeah, education. This is what you're doing here, right? Having one story, remember? Education, memorialization. So telling your story so that the next generation will take that story and carry it on. And sometimes people tell um, the stories of the people who didn't survive because they want their memories also to be, to live on. So I hope that what I, um, just went through was not too technical. Sue said, don't make it too academic. So I hope this wasn't too academic. And I'd be very interested in your responses. Many years ago in Melbourne, at the time of the first Holocaust exhibition, I don't know if you'll remember the old tramway shed. I was lucky enough to be assigned with a lady who had survived, but she had survived in Siberia. As part of her, um, help towards establishing this exhibition, it was interviewing Holocaust survivors. And a couple of things really stuck in my mind. One was a survivor said that the numbers on her arm, she told her children that that was a phone number she didn't want to forget. 
But when you were talking about some semblance of reality to hold on to the past to be able to continue into the future, she said a group of women used to sit down in the dirt when they had time in the evening and pretend they were cooking a meal and talking mm -hmm. about their menus. Okay, and there's a whole book on that, yeah. Yeah. which is, comes out of um, Teresian stuff. The, of recipes, which are absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Can you, anyone else have a question or, uh, or a comment? Sure. What about the effect of guilt? Of what? Guilt. Guilt. Or survivor guilt. Okay. Um, the question is, what about survivor guilt? So, to, when, my, my, when my friend Teddy is asked that question, her answer is, what do I have to be guilty about? I didn't do anything. So, just the fact that I survived, does that make me, I mean, she, and she's another person who took forever to begin to talk and to speak, and she's fabulous, but, yeah, people might feel, and, um, that somehow they survived and someone else didn't. And Victor Frankl actually writes in his memoir that the best of us did not survive, which I'm still not quite sure exactly what that means. I think that people can feel badly. Um, yes, they can feel guilty that somehow it was me and not the other person. I don't, I think that um, that's where people need help in getting past that because None of these people, survivors didn't do anything to deserve what Holocaust was not their fault. They didn't make this happen. So I don't know what else, but maybe you have a better answer. No, I don't, but just going on from that, just explaining in my mind that when you said what did I do, I didn't do anything, but I survived, but it wasn't your fault. And yet you know that this is the survivors got to Israel, there was the sheep that was slaughtered. Yes. And they were treated very, very badly. Yes. You all went by cheap to the slaughter. Why didn't you do something? Yes. Well, well, yes. You could have done something. Yeah. And I think that was a terrible uh, attitude. And also contributed to the survivors, some survivors, well, how did you, not only yes. why, but how come you survived? And somebody else. And somebody. Uh, and there's this. And that's where what? Well, Block. 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 I've spoken. Again, this statistic of one out of 600 survived. So that's a hard number to understand. I try to explain that to my students. Three University is a relatively small university. There are maybe 2,400 people on this campus altogether. That includes undergraduates, graduates, faculty, administration. So I say to them, so out of everybody having to do with this campus, four of you would have survived, and they gasp, and then they get it. It's sheer, that first cut is sheer luck, is how people survived. After the luck, they might have had skills, they might have had resources, there might have been more luck, but yes, I think that people, the expectation, because it is so unrealistic, you must have done, and especially for, for women, you know, who did you sleep with? I mean, but we have that in the same, in the corporate world. How'd you get to be president of it? You know, it, so these are, um, but they come from the perception, not of the survivor. They come from the perception of someone who didn't go through the experience. Yes? Uh, just an observation, following on what Mary Slade was talking about, the refugees or survivors who managed to get to Israel and uh, felt guilty, I, I was going to touch on a different point. When you were talking before about lying versus mice in terms of we just didn't have any more to give, and I just thought to myself, having then come to a country which was in a hostile environment, the resilience of some of them who all of a sudden had the existential threat of the surrounding countries that wanted to destroy them and having to pick up arms again. And I just can't imagine having gone through it to say, it's all over, now we've got to start all over again defending ourselves. It's just, yes. I mean, it's a tribute to human resilience, effectively. 
Yeah, it absolutely is. I think survivors are the most incredibly resilient people and we have gotten through that. But I remember when we were at Yacht Bishun, there was also another um, Shanti Bauer who talked about the fact that when he was growing up in Israel, nobody knew a survivor. But everybody was a survivor. So everybody knew a survivor, but nobody knew a survivor. He said that that stopped during the uh, Young People War, when all of a sudden, because the 67 war, Israel was, was triumphant, but in the 73 Young People War, all of a sudden people, those people who were saying, oh, you just went like sheep to the slaughter, became aware of the fact that this could be happening again to us, and I think that's, so this is what, 20, it's not even 20 years after the war ends, that the attitude begins to change. But yeah, there were terrible attitudes in, um, in Israel and the United States, and perhaps in North Australia too. Yes? I'm just curious about the actual food. Obviously, people didn't have any nutrition and so on. And there seem to be those who survived. about the food uh, that uh, uh, there was malnutrition as we all know there was lack of food and people seem to have those who survived are very resilient seems to me <coughs> that we living a very long life in fact I worked with many Holocaust survivors and I noticed that I lived in 95 97 and I wonder if there is any relationship between not having sufficient you know it may be it may be that their body at that time was, I mean, obviously it had to subsist on a lot less nutrition. Whether it's related to now, I don't know. I think that we know longevity is somehow related to genetics also. But there are also other kinds of physical ailments that survivors might have, even if they live a long life, that could be the result of uh, what they went through as well. There would also be a mental situation where we survived that. We would not give in that easily. Therefore, we live longer because we just don't give up. That's possible. Did everybody hear what he said? No. Yeah. No? No. Sure. No. There's one for me. Another addition. Do you have personality traits? Not such positive ones that you showed. Very important was the selfishness. And I give you the examples. You know, another with a child. A child is crying. One of the uh, youngest women who was working on a farm was coming back from work and she had an apple. So she decided to give it to the child. The mother gave the apple, she was dying anyway, and she ate it. The other example, when they arrived to um, <coughs> Stuttgart mm -hmm. and the mothers pushed away their little children because without the child they could survive. Okay. So it was not so positive, the whole thing. I didn't mean to imply that it was all so positive. What I was trying to emphasize is, I mean, even in that, to push the child away, there's an appraisal process that's going on there, which yeah, is they were that crying. Mom, they were there's an appraisal process, which is that this child is not going to survive. Why should I give it? I will survive. <clears throat> yes. I have a better chance. So really what I was trying to explore here was the ways in which people coped and managed and I didn't talk about some terrible things that people did. I mean, there were, I mean, which is why after the war, for those people who did really violated their belief system and their value systems, now to have to come back and deal with it, those are people who might really want to push this way down and not have to deal with it and not remember and try to numb themselves. So people did, yes, people did all kinds of things in order to survive, and then other people sacrifice themselves for somebody else. So you have a whole continuum of humanity. One of the things when I, with my students, I, I tell them that one of the things that I find intriguing about teaching about the Holocaust, learning about the Holocaust, is because it's the most existential subject that you could ever think of. It has the extremes of human behavior from the worst, people to the very best of people. And you 
you'll see that in the survivor behavior too. From the point of view of the child survivors, yes. do they, can they suffer from post-traumatic stress? I think it depends on what their experience was during the war. So, um, <coughs> Certainly, you know, for very, and it, and it depends on what you mean by child. So, um, you know, my friend Hetty was 14, Isabella Lightman was 14, they're considered to be child survivors. Um, um, younger than that. Younger. So, again, so think about the fact that in the selection process, most really young children didn't survive at all. They were in hiding. Could they, now, the, and hiding could be different, because hiding could be with a wonderful, wonderful family that really loves you and wants to keep you and doesn't even want to give you up. Hiding could be making you into a mini slave because that's your resource for them. Um, all of those experiences will affect how somebody comes out of the experience. So can they have, can some child survivors experience post-traumatic stress? Sure. And again, it depends on for, for people who were hidden, they had, there was a, for lack of a better word, a happier story, and that somebody actually took them in and saved them, even though the circumstances may not have always been that great. Um, so they have something to hold on to that in the sense of a belief that, a belief in a human being, a belief that someone will take care, someone cares enough. For somebody who is totally abandoned, yeah, they're going to have a heart. It's going to be much more difficult. And the stimuli that were in their environment when they were children, later as adults, could cue those same experiences. So it's possible. I'm not a clinician, so you need to ask the clinical psychologist that. Um, so, but I would say yes. Yeah. Some of the children really were drugs that were abused. I'm sorry? Some of the children were abused, yes, sexually were. abused, and physically abused. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not all the families were abused. Right. right. And my mother also blamed Jews who had lived all their life in Australia, for example, for not speaking up. Didn't they, when she went to Montefiore with her age, step on the steps of this, start to the Jewish people who were born in Australia and parents might have been born in Australia. Why didn't you do something? Didn't you hear about what was happening in Europe to us? Why didn't you get up and make a fuss about it? We blame the other people. They're not all excusing themselves. And there was a rabbi, Anglo Dantla, they called him something, who didn't sort of make. He's not in Australia. they 
I think my parents and people in my community were just terrified about what had happened. And did they know what was going on in Europe or not? Yeah, maybe you have to go to page 38 of the New York Times if you read Dougal Wittgenstein's book. But it was there. People knew. People were scared. And people were afraid of what would happen, at least in the United States. Yes. Um, I was a child here during the war. I fought here. And there was anti Semitism in Australia, as there was everywhere in the world at that time. It's very dangerous to try to judge things from the perspective of the world today as it was then. And I think a very big factor, if I read correctly in America, was that Roosevelt was scared that it would be seen to be a Jewish war. And with the anti Semitism in the United States, people wouldn't want to go and fight. There were all sorts of complications. And we also, as Jews here, my parents' attitude would have been lie low. It wasn't as it is. We didn't have Israel. We didn't have Benny Yahu coming out right. and making a great stand for Israel as we have today. Yeah, that's correct. Thank you. Yes. What are your thoughts on, I read a report years, many years ago, that the second generation is the most messed up generation in existence? Oh, um, well, yes. The comment was, I read a report at that time that the second generation is the most messed up generation that comes to existence because of what happened to parents and how that affected it, how that was said. Have you got any comment on that? Um, okay, I haven't heard that. I wonder where, what, what, if there was a study or literature, what this was based on. Because similar to what became known as survivor syndrome, which actually is PTSD, it's, it's exactly the same thing that we know now. How did they know, where did these symptoms come from? It came from people who went into therapy. So if you're going to generalize to a whole population from the people who went into therapy, that's really not uh, a fair generalization because there are tons of second generation who didn't go into therapy, who didn't experience that. So. Whoever said that might be basing it on a very select sample. I hope the second generation is okay with that. You can walk right beside the light now. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I was just going to add that in, um, with regards to second generation and third generation as well, that there is a huge body of literature on both the positive and negative effects mm -hmm. um, of what was transferred from survivors. I know from, um, from my grandparents in particular, I don't feel necessarily that I inherited Absolutely. Absolutely. And there have been lots of studies that have come out recently about that that show the intergenerational transmission of resilience, of hope, of optimism, of belief. So these may also be generational in the sense of when the research is done and who's doing the research. You know, so that's a whole other discussion. I think we might call it an evening, everybody. I think you'd all agree that we need to um, Thank Anne for sharing her wisdom, her insight, her knowledge. Such a erudite lecture for us that I think was perfectly pictured. So much that you said that resonated so much with me. Mm. But so much that I think for those who are guides in our audience of exhibits, a new way to approach looking at resistance mm -hmm. by looking at this framework, this theoretical framework. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. You're very, we really appreciate it. And this is also a small gift oh. book. Oh, thank you. Um, um, of the history of our museum that, oh, that, that will give you some understanding of this institution. Wonderful. As well. So thank you so thank much. You so much.